Hello, welcome to the Open Staff Workshop. My name is Anita Ruiter and I'm the Community Manager. With me, I have... Bart Leiter. I'm a Data Science Software Engineer from the uh, Short-Term Energy Forecasting Team of Aliana. Yes, and we also have two people behind the screens. So a shout out to both Frederik and Frank for helping us behind the scenes. <laughs> so uh, let's jump in. What are we going to do today? Well, first of all, we have a short presentation to just explain to you what OpenStaff is and why you would use it. Then, of course, we can jump into the workshop, which is the largest part of this afternoon. Uh, it has three parts. We'll explain during the workshop what this entails. So please don't be scared by if you don't recognize the terms uh, just yet. And in the end, we have 10 minutes to have a little conclusion of this workshop. So as we are with quite a lot of people, uh, if you have questions, please ask them in the chat. If they are relevant for a lot of people, are uh, behind the scene, uh, people will send them through to the larger audience. So let's start with a little bit of background, because I can imagine that some of you don't really know what exactly we are doing here. So we work at Aliander, which is a distributed grid operator in the Netherlands. So we distribute energy in both electricity and gas. And we have OpenSTEF. And OpenSTEF stands for Open Short Term energy forecasting. Okay, what is this? Well, this can be uh, the load on the grid, so uh, production and consumption on the grid uh, on a certain location. Well, up till now, we know what's ha what has happened, but as you can see by the question mark, we have no idea what's going to happen in the future. Well, this is where OpenStaff jumps in. As OpenStaff is able to predict into the future what is going to happen uh, on the load of the grid on a certain time and location. But why do we need energy forecasting? Why do we have open staff? Well, first, uh, we have a lot of challenges on the electricity grid. I think if you follow the news, you already have some ideas about this. So I'm asking you to write in the chat, what do you think the biggest challenges are before I just tell you? So let's say you have about 30 seconds to do so. I see a lot of good things coming in. Yes, great. So I see a lot of very uh, Good, complete answers. So flexibility, capacity, congestion, difficult to predict. Um, so yeah, really great answers. Let me give you a short recap of what we are struggling with. So the grid used to look like this. Nice and easy, not too complex. We, on the left side, we had centralized production. Then energy would flow one way to the consumers. And we as consumers were just consumer energy. And this was fairly easy to predict. However, currently, it looks more like this. This is, of course, still simplified. So instead of one centralized production point, we have decentralized production of wind and solar production. And besides being decentralized, it's also more irregular. It's difficult to predict, and we're not able to steer it. And also on the consumption side, we have some uh, additional issues. So consumers are also producers. I think a lot of you probably have solar panels on your roofs. But also we have a higher energy demand. This makes it quite difficult to predict. But not only that, it also means that we have capacity issues. So I think this was the most uh, named term in the chat, if I look at it now. So this is a map of the Netherlands, and it's the congestion map. So if uh, some parts of the country have a color, it means that we are not able uh, to add additional people to the grid. So companies or solar firms are not able to be connected to the grid because it just simply doesn't fit uh, over the cables and the transformers. Of course, we think in solutions and not in problems. So one way to solve this is to reduce your consumption or production if we expect an exceedance of the grid limitation. So an example of this is on your left. The blue line is your forecast. 
And as you can see, on one point, the blue line has a peak and it exceeds the grid limitations, which is the red line. So let's say that is production and it's a location where we all have a lot of solar energy. To prevent this peak from happening, we can ask one of the solar farms to turn down their solar panels for this short period of time. Thus, we curtail and we shave the peak. The result is that the realized load does not have this peak. Our grid is able to uh, still work, nothing breaks. Great. However, in order to be able to shave this peak, we have to know when it is happening. And this is where OpenSEF comes in. We need accurate forecast in order to be able to shave the peak. Very shortly, what is OpenSEF? Part will explain in more detail later on. But OpenSEF is a complete software stack to forecast the load on the electricity grid. And these are automated machine learning pipelines. So that is an automated step-by-step -step process to make sure that we um, can make easily uh, good forecast. However, I use the magic buzzword machine learning. I can imagine that some of you don't really know what that is. So let me give you a short introduction into machine learning and forecasting. But first, for me, in order to know what the level is a little bit in the room, please just throw everything in the chat, what you know about machine learning and forecasting. So in about 20, 30 seconds, just write down what you think machine learning and forecasting is. Okay, thank you for your answers. So I see a lot of data, finding patterns, output is the function of the input, <laughs> training a model. So I think a lot of uh, very good terms. I think some of you, of course, uh, have an idea. For the people who don't, we have a 100 seconds video to introduce you uh, to the subject. Do you have sound? Ja, allemaal, want ze zitten midden in de woonwijk. Hoeveel duurzaam dat ze geworden zijn? Ze gebruiken van sustainability targets, want ze willen hun.
Okay, great. So to summarize this video very shortly is that machine learning is not magic. Um, and you actually uh, learn, a computer learns patterns uh, through data, which is called training, and then is able to give uh, a forecast based on the patterns that it has learned from the input data. So now I've given you a very basic overview of why we need OpenStaff, what is machine learning, but now I give the word to Bart to actually explain what is OpenStaff. Yes, thank you. So I will continue on uh, explaining more about OpenStaff. And one of the key components of OpenStaff is the prediction job. It's a useful uh, tool to store all the relevant information that is required for OpenStaff in a single class. And this can be information such as the location of the point you want to predict in the grid, uh, some identifiers and the name of the prediction job. But also things like how, uh, how many uh, minutes you want to predict in the future. There are also quite some other things you can give to such prediction job, and you will actually find out yourselves during the, uh, during the workshop notebooks, as we will uh, then make one ourselves. And then using these prediction jobs together with the input data, you can then call the uh, aforementioned uh, fully automated machine learning pipelines of OpenStaff. And this is one of the uh, key selling points of OpenStaff as it makes um, the complex task of machine learning quite easy as a pipeline contains all the necessary steps that are required to make a forecast or train a model. And so these steps contain, for example, uh, data validation, feature engineering, training a model, making a forecast, uh, also evaluating such forecasts and even some post-processing steps. So all these um, required machine learning steps, they are all uh, combined within a pipeline, making it quite easy to perform the task. And so, for example, we have separate tasks for, of separate pipelines for uh, training them, um, a machine learning model uh, where we do data validation, feature engineering, and then train a model, uh, and also one for making a forecast and some others, as you will experience during the, the workshop later on. And so a bit deeper into how these, uh, these steps actually work within OpenStaff. Uh, when you use OpenStaff, you want to predict a target, which is usually the load on the grid. And you provide some external predictors that makes, uh, that allows OpenStaff uh, to make the forecast, such as weather forecast, uh, market prices, but also typical usage profiles of large types of customers. And OpenStaff will then automatically um, derive features from the uh, predictors you provide, such as the lagged load and derived weather features and even some calendar info. And then using this input, um, you can call the, the train model pipeline to train a model. And after having a trained model, you can then create a forecast. And that's um, a bit high over how uh, OpenStaff works under the hood. But I talked a lot about features and maybe it's a good idea to explain a bit more what features now actually are. So for example, the input features you provide uh, in the category of weather uh, forecast can be wind speed or temperature or solar radiation or, or wind direction. And then OpenStaff will automatically um, derive some features from this, such as the uh, global tilted radiation, um, humidity or vapor pressure, as these are apparently all good predictors for um, predicting the load on the grid. Then for the market prices, this can be in the case uh, in the Netherlands for short term forecasting the APX. So that's the Dutch day ahead uh, energy market price. And then the typical usage profiles, those are um, typical, well, typical usage profiles of a large type of customers as they usually have a certain type of load uh, which can be used as a feature. And then the date you provide with the uh, timestamps, um, OpenStaff will derive from this whether the date you want to predict is a holiday or a weekday or a weekend day. 
as power usage usually changes uh, uh, between those types of days. And then finally, you provide the historical load and then OpenStaff will derive the, the lag load from this. And I already saw a question in the chat about what the lag load means. It means um, what the load was at the earlier moment. So for example, if you predict the, uh, want to predict um, the load somewhere in the future, in the future, the lag load feature could be what was the load seven days ago or one day ago, or even 15 minutes ago, depending on how far you want to predict in the future. As you usually see that, um, the load is quite a repeating pattern. Um, and OpenStaff will use all those features to train a model. And then depending on the, um, depending on the, the location or the, the load you want to predict, it will automatically assign some kind of importance for each of those features. As some features are more relevant than others for certain locations, for example, here you see a feature importance plot, which means uh, that a feature with a large square uh, has a high feature importance and the low square has over low low size square is a low feature importance square. So you can see that T minus seven D has a quite high score. So that was the load a week ago. That was quite important. And also the wind power fit extrapolated, which is a derived feature from uh, wind speed. Um, so this indicates that there's quite some wind behind this location. When you look at, um, for example, here, the, um, the radiation feature, you see that's a, quite a smaller square. So OpenStaff automatically uh, learned that there is not so much solar energy behind this location, but a lot of wind energy. So that's a really nice feature of, of OpenStaff, and it also indicates some um, uh, of uh, indicate some kind of explainability of the model, which is quite nice. Um, then another feature from OpenStaff is that it also provides quantiles, which can be quite difficult uh, to explain, but I will try to give a high level overview. Because the machine learning model is not always 100% sure of the output prediction it makes. For example, here we see a graph with the blue line being what is forecasted for load, and then the red line, what was being measured afterwards, and the green lines are the quantiles. And so you see that the prediction was usually quite good during nighttime, as that is quite easy to predict. And there you see that these, these green lines, these quantiles are quite narrow, uh, indicating a very uh, high confidence of the prediction that was being made. And during day, when there's a lot of varying usage and, uh, for example, uh, or more activity on the grid, I think that's a good way to summarize it, then it becomes harder to predict the load. And there you can see a wider interval um, indicating that the, the prediction um, could be a bit off, uh, which was also the case here. So that's um, some indication of the model of the certainty uh, of the prediction that's made. And then another thing that is good to discuss is you can actually have, when you look at the load, you can actually have a negative load, such as here in this, in this graph. And what that means for OpenStaff is that there is more production than consumption. So in this case, there would be more, more energy generated by, for example, uh, windmills or solar energy, then there is consumed by, for example, factories or households. Uh, so then you get a negative load. And uh, here you see a positive load, which means there is more uh, consumption than production at this location. So then you see the load being uh, higher than zero. And finally, I uh, also want to say that we from Aleander are not the only ones working on, on OpenStaff. It is really a community effort, and we have quite some companies working together uh, with us working on OpenStaff, uh, which we are very grateful for. And if you are also interested uh, into, into helping, uh, well, you can also join the community. Uh, we also have community meetings, and we will uh, uh, show that later on. Welcome back. Uh, 
I will start sharing um, the notebooks or the exercises. So if you haven't done so already, we have mentioned it already a few times. Um, here you can see the um, well, the instructions for the advanced notebooks, the preparation. So you only need to install Python and be able to run a Jupyter notebook and install the requirements. And a good way to test if everything works is to go to start Jupyter notebook, go to the folder uh, workshop advanced, and then start the first workshop uh, notebook. So that's workshop one train model, not the answers. And then uh, you can run the the first cell. And if everything is all right, then you should not see errors and see a number indicating that it um, ran successfully. And if you have issues with, with this, you can play something in the chat. And if you feel to get it working, um, eventually it might be a good idea to then uh, join the other room of the beginner notebooks of the beginner exercises, as there you do not need this setup. Maybe as an, an addition, if you have it working, um, you could also share it in the, in the chat, then we know uh, that it's at least working for some people. That's a good one. Okay, I see already multiple messages coming in, so that's good. Right. So let's then uh, start with explaining what we're going to do. Um, so this workshop has three different parts. We're going to train a model, we're going to make a forecast, and eventually perform a backtest. This first uh, workshop part is about training a model. And um, the goal of this, this exercise is to get some experience um, using OpenStaff and performing this task and to see how easy it is. So the learning points are learning how a prediction job works, uh, what the most important parameters mean for the uh, that are required for training a model, then what data is required for OpenStaff to train a model, uh, get some experience with the train model pipeline, um, see how the model gets automatically loaded and stored, and how to get some info on the trained model to verify the training process. So, um, well, first step is to run this first cell so the, the imports are done, so you can actually use OpenStaff. And then we can go to the first exercise. <clears throat> where are we going to define a prediction job? So OpenStaff uses these, uh, as I already discussed in the presentation, it uses these prediction jobs to define the properties. Um, so all the information required for OpenStaff is there in one place. And so for each location you want to predict, you would have your own prediction job. And for this workshop, we're going to make our own. Um, and there is already some code given here for creating the prediction job. However, it is missing some parts. And your exercise is to, um, to add certain information to it, which we described here. So a location in form of a latitude and longitude, as these are used, for example, for calculating derived weather features by OpenStaff. Uh, also the horizon minutes, so the, the horizon of the, the desired forecast in minutes. Uh, so that's how far uh, in the future you want to predict. And then also the quantiles, which um, uh, which were the the insert which indicate the uncertainty of the model, the confidence interval. And um, to give a hint about how you do this, we have a link here in the notebook to the documentation. So if you open this, you get uh, some documentation of the prediction job class and here you can also see all the different types of uh, 
things you can put in a prediction job. So your assignment is to find out what is uh, what the correct uh, what the correct way is to add this to the prediction job. And for this, you will have uh, I would say five minutes also to read uh, to read a bit about the prediction job, and then I will go over the answers. And if you have any questions, of course, please uh, use the chat. Um, I see a question from Thais. Um, it was the, the horizon in minutes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I see. That's. <laughs> That's probably in a small issue with. Uh... It, yeah, so I guess right. It says indeed in the notebook horizon minutes is zero point twenty five, but I think that's a mistake. So that should yeah. be uh, fifteen. Yeah, so it's mis a mistake in the notebook. For training the model, it should not. Uh, it should not matter.
All right, so five minutes have passed. Um, let's look together at the uh, at the answer. Well, Fredek is also answering some questions in chat. So here we have the the answers for the the prediction job. Um, so you can see that the the quantiles are added as a list of floats, as you can also see in the um, documentation. Here, when you scroll to quantiles, so the quantiles that have to be forecasted, this can be nothing if you don't want these for a list of floating point units. Um, so these are defined here. Then the latitude and longitude can also be quite easily added, just giving them as a float for, for let and long. And the, the horizon minutes can basically be copied, uh, which does the same, although this number is probably, probably wrong, uh, the idea is the same. Um, so if you run this, it should not uh, spit any errors. So that was, um, so also, if there are further questions on this, please uh, let us know in the chat. And then we can move on to the, the second preparation uh, step. So now we have to find a prediction job. The only thing that is left is to uh, prepare input data to train the model on. Um, so we already gave here some code to load the data. We also provided uh, data for this exercise uh, in the uh, code repository. So this should be able to, to run. Uh, and this is input data for, uh, for a location that has a lot of uh, solar power behind it. Therefore, the name Sun Heavy. Um, and the given code will, will, will print this data and then it will um, also make a split for training and test data, which we will we'll go over in uh, in the next workshop part. And then we make some plots about some columns in this data, for example, the load and two of the weather features. And the exercise for you is to uh, to look at this input data and explain what type of features you see in the input data. You can um, well just type there some type it somewhere. Um, also, another question is how much data of how much time is there between two data points in the in the data? And then, when looking at the plots for the radiation and wind speed, um, do you see any patterns from this? Um, for example, uh, what happens to the load when there is a peak in one of these two predictors? Can you explain why? And for these plots, we also zoomed in uh, in a specific week uh, or a random week. Um, so it's a bit easier to, to look at the data. So this exercise is really more about understanding the input data. So you get a bit of a feeling for what type of data OpenStaff expects. So if everything is right, you should be able to just run all these, um, run all these cells and it should generate some plots. And again, for this, uh, we will give you uh, five minutes to um, to get your answers, and then we will go over it together. We will also ask uh, ask some of you to to place the answers in the chat, but please wait with that until a few minutes have passed, so everyone can think on their own.
So let's go over the answers. So I've also run the code here. And so for the first question, what type of input features do you see in the input data? Um, well, first of all, here you see the, the load, the, the thing you want to predict. Um, you also see here some, some weather related features, such as wind speed and radiation. And here we have APX, which was the, the, the day I had market price. And then we have these seemingly randomly uh, ra random numbers and letters combinations. And these are actually, as was already guessed in the chat correctly, uh, typical usage profiles of large types of customers. Um, these are also publicly available. Um, and one minor detail, if it ends on an I, it means inname, which is Dutch for, for um, I think it was, these are the uh, generation profiles and the A are for uh, consumption profiles. So these are the three types of features you provide to OpenStep, the long-term profiles, the market prices and the weather data and the load, of course. And when we go to the second question, um, how much time is there between two data points? So we see 15 minutes between each row. So that means that there's 15 minutes between each data point. And then finally, for the, the plots for radiation and wind speed, um, what patterns do you see? And would be, I would be interested in what, uh, what patterns you see for these, uh, two types of plots. So please place your answer in the chat if you want. Yeah, so we see here radiation is highly cyclical. That's correct. You see a uh, for the solar radiation, you see a quite spiky pattern, and this can be explained by um, that the the radiation is zero during during nighttime, and this is actually when the sun is not shining, so there's no solar radiation, and only during during daytime when the sun is directly shining onto solar panels, then you will have AI radiation. And wind is indeed more continuous. So it does not have this, this repeating pattern. It's more indeed continuous with some uh, small spikes here and there. So it's more irregular. And then when you when you compare it to the load, as was added or was asked here. So when you look at um, at the load, you see during daytime you see these peaks going down, and these also correspond to radiation going up. So what it means here is that when um, when the sun starts shining, there is more generation in the grid which compensates for the consumption as this is a positive load. Uh, so you see the, the consumption going down. So that was it for, for this question. And let's go to the, to the next one. And now we are actually going to use OpenStaff. Um, to uh, to train a model, so that's really nice. We now have the the 
uh, we now have the prediction job and the input data prepared. Um, oh, I have to move here. Yes. So now the exercise is to to use an OpenStep pipeline and to train a model using this prediction job and the and the training data. Um, and the idea of this is that these pipelines should be very easy. Um, so there's already some some basic code here given, but it misses some things like which pipeline should be used and what parameters should be added. And for this, uh, similar to the prediction job exercise, um, you can look this when you click on this link. Here you have a high level overview of the um, of the pipelines of OpenStaff. And when you click on one, um, you can then see what what type of data it requires. So your exercise is to um, to create something that trains the model. Um, and this, is, this should be quite quite easy. I will only give like two minutes for this, and then we'll go over it. So let's go over the answers. I also see a question here for about the, the input CSV file. So if you give less features, such as no uh, standard profiles, uh, would it then still work? Uh, well, yes. That's uh, also one of the, the nice features of OpenStaff is that uh, the only real feature that is required is, uh, is the load. Um, as this is something you want to predict, and you can uh, add your own features as columns very easily. So if you want to, if you, if you don't have certain profiles available or not uh, have certain weather features available or they're not relevant for your model, then you can just uh, leave them out and you can provide your own uh, predictors of which you think um, can help OpenStaff predict the load. So for the the answer here, so the answer was we need the the train model pipeline as this is quite descriptive for training a model, 
And the only things you actually need to give it is just the prediction job and the training data. Um, the other parameters that were already given were uh, they check for old model age. So OpenStaff also checks for uh, if a previously trained model, um, it, it, it checks the age of it so it um, can skip training. Um, and these last two arguments are for um, for ML flow, which is something that uh, keeps track of the model storage. So this makes sure that when a model is trained, it is stored somewhere. And when you later um, use the same prediction job again, uh, ML flow will automatically load the correct, uh, the latest correct model for that prediction job. And so if everything went right, then you should have uh, gotten some logs like this, um, also saying that something was stored, writing reports, for example, and looking at and looking at those reports, it just wrote um, is part of the next exercise. So here we will will analyze the trained model, um, because now we have a model that we uh, want to look at it. And during training, OpenStaff automatically uh, generates some um, some some reports on the, the trained model, so you can verify how the training process went and what the feature importances were. Um, so therefore, the question is to to look at feature importance plot. Um, so this code below will uh, generate some plots. The 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 first two plots will be the predictor in action. So that is um, some kind of evaluation on the training and validation data for two different predictors. And so these predictors mean how far in advance were the predictions made. So 0 0.25 means that the prediction was always made 15 minutes advance of the current time. And 47 means that the prediction was made 47 hours in advance, so a lot further in advance. And then the question is, uh, which time horizon, which of these two are more accurate, and also why. And um, to give a bit of a hint on how you want to find this out, is to zoom in on the uh, on similar days and uh, compare them to each other. Uh, and the second exercise is for the last plot. This, that's the, the, the feature importance plot you also saw in the presentation. And here the question is, what are the most important features? And for this, we will give, uh, I think, uh, three minutes, two minutes, and then we will go over it together.
So let's go over the, the answers as we're running a bit behind schedule. Um, here we see these three, uh, these three plots. So for the first question, what are the most important features? Here you see a very large square for E1A AMII. So that's one of the uh, standard profiles for a large type of customer. Um, we also see T minus 15 minutes. So that's a important feature. Um, so it is one of the lag load features. So it is the load 15 minutes in advance. And as you can imagine, if you know the load 15 minutes in advance or of before, you can uh, probably make a good educated guess about what the load will be in the next 15 minutes, as it usually doesn't change that much. Uh, then we also have the clouds and the radiation taking quite a large of, of space here, um, which can be explained by the large solar peaks, as you see here. So there's quite a lot of uh, sun behind this location. Um, and you will not see wind speed very large here because there is no clear relation between the wind speed for this location. And then for the question, which time horizon is more accurate? Um, so let's just zoom in here on, uh, or I already zoomed in on, on this week in November. And here you see that uh, with the predictor of 50 minutes, um, you see that the validation predict, so that was what predicted in the validation set, uh, quite matches the solar peak here. And even zoom in a bit more. So it matches it quite well. But then when we wanted to predict this um, 47 hours in advance, then you see that the model does it quite a lot worse. It kind of misses the peak because it's a lot difficult, a lot more difficult to, um, to predict uh, so far in advance. And uh, with that, we reach the end of the first part of the, the workshop. Let's say let's take three minutes break until 15.10. Uh, you can post some remaining questions in the chat, of course. I will be here to answer them, and then we will move on to the uh, to the second workshop, which is about making a forecast using the model we just ran.
So let's continue with the second part of the workshop. We're now going to use the model we just trained um, to make a forecast. Um, but also know uh, it's not an issue if somehow with, for some technical difficulty reasons or something else, you were unable to train a model uh, because we already have provide one, provided one uh, in the repository. Um, so this in this workshop part, we will uh, use this to make a, a forecast. And the learning points of this are to get some hands-on experience using uh, using the trained model. Um, again, what data is required to make the forecast. Um, also to get some experience again with using the pipelines, this time for the forecast pipeline. Uh, where you can then hopefully also see how the model gets automatically loaded. And finally, we will do some bit of evaluation on the predictions by comparing it to the measurements to see um, what was actually predicted by the model. Um, so again, good start is to just run the first cell for the imports. Um, then again, we have to define a prediction job, but as we already did this during the second or the, the first uh, workshop notebook, um, we just skip it here. And um, we will now look more into the preparation of the input data. Um, so again, the input data here is loaded from the CSV file. It's the same data as before. Um, and this is something we also already did during the uh, first workshop, uh, where we split the, the uh, input data into a training and a test set, so that the model is only trained on the training data and only uh, evaluated on test data. So to make the forecast, we want to use test data here. So your exercise is to, to split the input data um, into a training and a test set. And for this, we want the test set to have or contain only the last 192 rows for testing. And as we already found out before, um, the time between each data point is, or between each row is 15 minutes. So 192 means uh, that we want to make a prediction for two days in advance. Um, and if you struggle with this, if you have not worked with uh, with Panda's data frames before, um, this can be quite the exercise. So we also have a link here for the, the documentation on the operation you have to use. Um, and by running the second cell, you can check if indeed the test set that was created contains 192 rows. So that's a validation step for yourself. So you don't have to wait for the, for the answers in a few minutes. And the last uh, cell of code um, is already finished and it makes a copy for the data to forecast and the realized data. By setting the to forecast data, uh, setting the load to nonce, uh, so removing the load as we want to forecast this, and then we can compare this to the measurements uh, later on. So let's uh, take a few minutes for, um, let's say, uh, two minutes to to do this exercise.
So let's look at the answers. Um, we actually already did exactly the same thing in the previous notebook, only then the goat was already given. So you could have peeked there if you were unsure, um, but using the .ilog function on a data frame, you can select certain rows. So for the training data, we used everything up to until the last 192 rows. And then for the test data set, we selected the last 192 rows. And when we ran this line, we saw nothing. So that means the check has passed. And then we have um, run this code as well, which is important for the next part, which we will go to now, is making a prediction. So now we have the, again, the prediction job and the uh, input data processed. Um, so now the task is again to, to look at the OpenStep website, uh, which you can find here, uh, to see which pipeline we should use. Uh, and also, again, which input data you need to use. Um, quite similar exercise to the last one. So let's just take uh, let's just take two minutes for this, and then we will uh, go over it. So again, let's look at the answer. Um, again, it was quite straightforward with using the create forecast pipeline for this. Uh, and also, again, you only need to provide the prediction job and the input data. Um, but here it is important that you use the two forecast data instead of the entire input data. Um, as we just made this to forecast data um, where the load was missing. So the model can now um, well, fill this, those missing loads back in with, with the prediction. Uh, we, we certainly do not want to use the train data for this, as the model has already been trained on this data. So it has seen this data before. Um, so it would probably perform way too good and is not a, a 
good way to evaluate the performance of the model as it's not it does not show how generalizable the results are and as you can see here when you look at the the logs making the prediction only took or running the entire pipeline even which includes making the prediction only took like three seconds so that's not uh, not much um also during the first um during the first workshop file we did a similar exercise for training the model and there uh something i forgot to mention is it should only uh, have taken less than half a minute to run the entire pipeline which is a key advantage of using these uh, uh, gradient boosted decision tree classifiers that we uh, or models that we use in the background of OpenStaff. Um, so let's go to the to the next exercise. Now we have made a forecast, but we want to look at the forecast, of course, not at the logs. Um, so we have provided some plots here. Uh, first, we will show the table of the forecast, where you can see the information uh, that was outputted by the pipeline. Uh, then we make a plot of the uh, of the load of the forecast itself, and then we will have two plots here where we show the. Um, I can show it actually here. So this is the 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 load and the forecast together. That was the first plot. Uh, and then we see two plots with the um, with the radi radiation uh, and the forecast. So you can clearly see more of a um, relationship between those two. And we did the same for the wind speed. And so the question for this um, for this exercise is to look at the results and to see when is the model more accurate and when is it less accurate? And also try to explain why. Um, also, please uh, answer in the chat if you know the answer. I'm interested in to, to hear your uh, explanations, and then we will go over it in a few minutes. And then second part of the exercise is to look at the weather features compared to the forecast. And again, do you see some kind of correlation? So let's take a few minutes for this.
I already see some uh, some answers coming up in the chat. I see uh, that the model underestimates the, the peak, better to use higher quantiles for forecasting peaks only. And the need the, uh, the peak is quite underestimated here. So indeed, it would be useful to also then add the quantiles um, to give you a bit more information. And these quantiles, they are present in the output data, as you can see here in the table. So these columns match the quantiles that were provided uh, in the prediction job. Um, in the next workshop part, we will uh, also actually plot these, uh, not here right now. And indeed, you see that during during daytime, uh, the forecast quality is a lot worse than uh, during nighttime because during nighttime uh, it is just easier to predict the load as less is happening on the grid. And then for the second question, look at the two weather features plotted. Do you see correlation? So it is similar to the the um, what we've seen before. We see when the radiation goes up, we see a again a a dip in the uh, predicted load because of the the increased uh, solar generation. And for wind speed, we do not see any relation, as it seems quite uh, quite random. And so to to uh, to finish this part of the um, finish this part of the workshop, uh, we go to the last exercise, and there we go a bit more deeper into this relation between the solar radiation and the, the predicted load. Because here, um, we already provided some code to divide the radiation feature by 10. So we're going to decrease the, the input for the forecast for the radiation. Uh, and then we will use the same pipeline to make another forecast. Uh, and then we will compare them in a plot below which should look something like this. And then the question is, uh, what happens to the forecast when the radiation is divided by 10? And also, can you explain why? Um, we'll have uh, two minutes for this exercise as well. And again, please let us know in the, in the chat why you think or what you think uh, happens to the forecast and why. So maybe a bit of an extra explanation. So the blue line here is the radiation feature. The red line is the prediction we just made in the previous exercise. And now the green line is the forecast made on the same model, but with the radiation feature divided by 10 of the input data.
Yeah, so I already see an answer here, or multiple answers. Uh, so the model sees a lot less radiation and therefore reduces the predicted low dip caused by solar generation. Um, I think that's a very good description of what, what happens. So the input, uh, the input data contained uh, for the green line less radiation. So the model thinks there is less solar energy and therefore um, uh, it will, will predict less uh, moment. Uh, therefore it will predict less um, solar generation um, which means less consumption being compensated by generation so a which results in a higher load similar to what uh, happened in the day afterwards when there was almost no radiation then you have a more high more higher load So yeah, indeed, the forecasted values will go up as the model was trained with normal radiation features. That's a, indeed a very good observation. And those are a lot lower now. So the model cannot magically uh, predict the, the solar peak because um, the input data was not uh, did not correspond to that. So I think you uh, understand it quite well. So let's have a break until 37 but if you don't want to take a break we do have a bonus question here it's not 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 much of a question it's just just a bonus we do have a uh, a dashboard for open staff um where you can see everything you want to know about our forecast and we do have a kind of interactive image of this of that with this link and here you can hover over different uh, different parts of our dashboard. And here you can see, for example, these feed plots again. Then when you hover over it on the bottom left of the screen, you will then see an explanation of what this means. Um, so if you integrate OpenStaff, you could also have a fancy dashboard like this. And then let's uh, continue in uh, at 37 with the third part and the final part of the workshop.
So let's go to the final part of the workshop. And here we will perform a backtest. Um, and so a backtest might be might be a new term. So um, one of the learning points of this workshop part is uh, well to also explain uh, to learn what a, a uh, backtest is and how it works on a high level and then again get some hands-on experience on performing a bit of evaluation using this spec test um, and then hopefully also to be able to uh, understand the results of the back test how to interpret it and so basically high over what the back test is it is a, a form of evaluation um, of the model and for this you use historical data uh, and predict them as if they were uh, in the future. So you can then compare them to the measurements. Um, so it's a way of testing how OpenStep would have performed if it had been used in the past. And from this, you can also uh, calculate some metrics, but we will go over that in the end. Um, so similar to the previous notebooks, uh, we have to do some imports here, so you can run the cell. Uh, again, you need a prediction job uh, and the input data, but as we have seen this already twice, we just gave the data here. Uh, and for the um, and for the the back test, we do not need to make a split for a test and uh, training test data, as this already uh, is done by OpenStaff automatically in the pipeline. Uh, so we can jump actually immediately to performing the backtest. Um, so similar to, to the last two um, notebooks, uh, we will ask you to uh, select the correct pipeline and provide the correct inputs for the pipeline. Um, and a bit of a hint, to make the backtest, you only need one single pipeline. So let's uh, let's take uh, two minutes for uh, two minutes for this, or one minute for this. And also, if you have some question about backtest, uh, please ask them in the chat. So let's go to the answer here. Um, so to perform the back test, you need to run the train model and forecast back test pipeline, as that is what the back test pipeline does. It also trains the model and uh, creates predictions. So it does everything for you. And again, you only need to um, 
provide the, the prediction job and the input data. Um, and it should take not too long to run this. Um, so let's just dive dive into looking at the results of a backtest. So we already uh, gave the code to make these plots, and this time we also added plots for the quantiles to give a bit of an indication about the uncertainty of the model. Um, and you see here two plots for two different uh, time horizons. So forecast made as if they were uh, made 15 minutes in advance or if they were made 47 hours in advance. Um, and you see here that the, the blue line is the forecast made by the back test or by, by OpenStaff, and then the red line is the measurement with the green line being the quantiles. Um, and you can zoom in on these graphs to look in more detail for certain days. The question is here, when do you see that the model is uncertain? And why do you uh, think it is uncertain at those times? Um, second question is, what differences do you see between the two horizons? So the forecast made 15 minutes in advance or 47 hours in advance. You can look again at that by zooming in on certain days and seeing the difference. Um, and then also, what difference do you see between the forecast and the, uh, the measurements, the realized load? Um, So again, please answer. Uh, please answer your or put your answers in the chat if you want. Um, because again, quite interested in in your in your your uh, your opinions on this. And for those who have time left, um, you can also use OpenStaff to. Um, to actually calculate some kind of numbers to um, to quantify the the performance of the model, and for this we have a matrix matrix package, um, and there is some documentation on that. If you click here, um, so you can um, choose a metric and calculate it yourself to see the difference between the two horizons. Uh, but this is optional. If you do not uh, manage to do this, that's fine. So let's take uh, let's take a few minutes to uh, to work on this. And that's also the uh, last exercise of the uh, of the workshop for today.
Ah, I see a message by Jochem in the chat about the typo in the final plotting. Uh, that is correct. There is a typo. Uh, I thought we had. Uh, I thought I had fixed this. <laughs> Apparently, only in the answers. So, um, please change the deadline if you want to uh, also see the the results for the for the eighth. 47 hour in advance, but I think it might be a good idea to just um, look together at my screen because I guess it's time for the looking at the answers. Um, and here there is a, a difference between the, the two plots. So the first question is when is the model uncertain? There was already quite a good answer here in the chat. Um, the, it's a during the day as weather is uncertain. That's a very good answer. So you see a very wide uh, confidence interval. So these quantiles are very wide apart during the day. So around 12 o'clock, um, indicating that uh, Opus staff is quite uncertain about the prediction, even though it actually quite matches the uh, actual load, it still was quite uncertain about it. And during nighttime, uh, it was not um, indicated by narrow green lines. Um, and indeed why this is, because there's a lot more activity during daytime. So especially for, uh, for, for solar generation, uh, because the input features are also forecast made by weather uh, weather forecasting, uh, which have some quite high uncertainty. Then for the second answer, what differences do you see between the horizons? We we'll actually see that uh, I already zoomed in a bit on a few days. Uh, you actually see that the 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 Confidence band is a lot higher during um, is a lot higher uh, for the 47 hour horizon, um, and we also see that the predictions are a bit more off for the 47 hour horizon, and that's just because it's a lot harder to predict further in the future. And then finally. Um, when we look at the difference between the forecast and the realized, we actually see uh, that the forecast quite match the the uh, the realized load, which is great. OpenStaff was able to uh, forecast the load quite well, at least 50 minutes in advance, 47 hours in advance. It was a bit worse, and this was also something you could have uh, measured with a metric. So this is the answer to the bonus question. Uh, here we used the from the openstaff.metrics. Uh, uh, we use the mean absolute error um, to uh, calculate the mean absolute error between the two uh, between the two horizons. Uh, well, between the horizon and the the realized uh, load, and then for each horizon we did that. And we see a large, a larger mean absolute error for the large time horizon and a smaller mean absolute error for the low uh, time horizon, indicating that indeed the model is better when you only predict 50 minutes in advance. So that's uh, that wraps it up for the the uh, final workshop part. For the conclusion of the workshop already. Uh, time flies when you're having fun. I hope everyone had fun during the workshop today. Uh, so let's get into it. So <laughs> I can imagine that I hopefully you've learned a lot uh, today about OpenStaff, but we're also curious if it didn't, did indeed was the case. So you can answer in the chat, what did you learn? Did you learn what you were expecting to learn? Uh, and are you able to explain what OpenStaff does right now? You can answer in the chat or even think about this for yourself. We would really like to ask you to fill in the survey. 
So you can find a QR code on the screen. So you can just scan it with your phone. If you're afraid of QR codes um, or you prefer just to have a link, Frank will send the link in the chat. Uh, oh, he's already yeah. sent it in the chat. So please fill this out for us because it's really useful to get some feedback. Especially from uh, since this was our first time giving the workshop. So any feedback is really welcome. Yes. So thanks in advance for filling out our survey. So I can also imagine that well, you've had this workshop, you've really enjoyed yourself, but well, what to do now with OpenStaff? Well, luckily we've only showed you a little bit of what OpenStaff is able to do. So we have an entire list of things that you can actually continue with. If you want to have a more of an introduction, I would really recommend starting with our example notebooks, of which the links will also be shared in the chat by Frank. So then this is the time for us to thank you for joining our workshop. If you have any questions, you're still really able to send them in the chat but you can also send us an email and our email address is shown on the slide right now. Yes, so thank you for, uh, for joining. Yeah, and hopefully see you next time. Bye. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you, bye.